Uh, Tony Campolo had a professor uh, in college that kind of referenced that old, you know, prayer that many of us can be learned saying at bedtime. Maybe some of you still say it. You know, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's right. And he said, you know, I, I, I get that. I get what it means. That's obviously a very important prayer. But he wa- I wonder if the words haven't been somehow mixed up a little bit. I wonder if we shouldn't pray, if I should wake before I die. If I should wake before I die, the implication being that, that are there not people around kind of like who are, who are spiritually asleep and they might die before they have truly woken up to the things that matter most. And so today's central text is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him might not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. Imagine dying before, getting the chance to respond to that incredible offer and gift and promise from God. Imagine not being awake before physically dying and not having had the opportunity to live differently, to be transformed, to live this abundant, powerful life that Jesus has promised for us. What a travesty that would be for God so loved the world. Now, this is clearly, I, I think, the most famous Bible verse like in the history of the world. Uh, it's clearly important to God. It's important to God's people. Uh, but it's also kind of seeped into the collective consciousness of the people in this world in which we live, right? You see it held up at placards at football games. You, um, you know, walk through a variety of cemeteries. I don't think there's a verse that I've seen more engraved under people's names than John uh, 3.16. And <laughs> Recently, the radio was on, and Keith Urban, you know, the, the country music star, had a song about three important Johns in his life, John Cougar, John Deere, John 316. Now, I know, I, hopefully that's not the order of priority. John 316 has got to be more important than a tractor. Anyway, but with a bit more of a theological lens on the significance of this verse, Puritan biblical commentator Matthew Henry says it's the word of reconciliation in miniature, meaning the word of peace or forgiveness, bridging the gap between God and sinful humanity. It's, it's this word of peace of reconciliation in miniature, meaning in summary. It's a summary of the gospel message. Max Lucado, the devotional writer, said that if you've never read the Bible before, start here. If you know, already know everything in the Bible, return here. So we're going to focus on this very important verse today, and we're going to open up the scriptures to John chapter 3. Uh, Beginning at verse 1, if you've got your Bibles, that's great. Maybe you're following along with the app. Um, So here's how we're going to proceed. I'm reading from the NIV. I'm going to read the first 15 verses. I'm not going to explain them because we talked about them last week. This is the start of the conversation with Nicodemus, that um, a ruler uh, amongst his people, and he comes at night to inquire of Jesus and talks about being born again. We talked about all that last week, so I'm not going to get into that, but I want to read it again because it provides kind of the narrative flow Uh, into verse 16 and beyond. Now, there's a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one, and now he gives them an example of one of those heavenly things. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Okay, so that's that first section. If you want to kind of get into that a bit more, you missed last week, you can go back and listen to the podcast or, or see the video. We continue at verse 16. So that sets up what we're about to read. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, what we're going to, since that's the central verse and that's the focus, I'm going to keep reading past it, explain a few things. Then we're going to come back to that verse and just dwell on that for a little bit as we unpack it slowly, okay? Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son, pause. So these verses tell us what God's intent is. God has an intent of love. He doesn't come, doesn't send the Son, Jesus, into the world to condemn. He comes on this divine rescue mission of love. That's the purpose of God. It reveals to us something so incredible and beautiful about God's heart. He is on a divine rescue mission of love in Jesus. And part of the reason that is so incredibly significant is because the gravity and the natural gravity and slope of our world is toward condemnation. Now, part of the reason that this is so very vital is because we can think that, oh, everyone's coming to the world. It's neutral. It's, it's, it's neutral. It's a level playing field. And God may be there, maybe not. Jesus, does he really matter? Heaven, hell, who knows? It's all evil. Okay, yeah, God might be nice. No, no, no. Verse 18, the natural slant and slope of the world that we naturally come into is toward condemnation. Verse 18. What does he also say in these verses? He says to believe. It's important to believe in Jesus. This is part of the remedy. See, God knows the reality. We live in this broken, sinful, dark world that has so much evil. And so he sends Jesus on this divine rescue plan, and he stretches out his arm to us in Christ, and and we are to believe. To believe is our response. To believe is the way we grab onto that hand that hand of rescue. Now, what does it mean to believe? It means personal, genuine trust, specifically in two things. Personal, genuine trust in first, that Jesus is who he says he is. God's son, the Messiah. And Messiah is a Hebrew word meaning anointed one. Um, the the, the long-awaited uh, God's chosen king and representative on the earth. But also the other part is that it, to believe in Jesus is to believe in what he has done for us on the cross. Remember that these verses go back and explain what happened in verses 14 and 15, which is the reference to him being lifted up on the cross. And anyone who looks to him, believes in him, will have eternal life. So it's really this personal, genuine trust that Jesus is, in fact, who he says he is and in what he has done for us on the cross. So it's not just like, oh, Jesus existed. He was a nice guy. No, no, no. To believe in one and not the other is not genuine belief. And it's free. It's free. It's this free gift that that, that is given to us. This is so incredibly amazing. And this is hard and sometimes even offensive for some people to believe. Really, it can't can't be that easy. We are so immersed and soaked in a world that has taught us that you have to earn stuff that's valuable and important. That is often the case, but not here. You can't earn it. You can't be a really nice person. It doesn't say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever hit moral home runs every day would have eternal life. Who never made a mistake doesn't say that, does it? Talks about belief, and it's this free, wonderful gift that we have in Jesus. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Why is that? Well, what is the fundamental sin in the Bible? It's pride. It's ego. It's me first. It's selfishness. It's I know better than other people. I know better than God. I know better than his word. And so the, so, so, so the counter to that The the ultimate virtue is humility. It's humility, and humility and belief go side by side, hand in hand, because it's only that point and realize we can't do it all ourselves, that we can't earn it, that we can come to faith. Continuing verse 19, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, it will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. <clears throat> kids, when they've done something bad, they hide. They hide it or themselves. They don't want to be found out. We never stop doing this, except when we grow up and become adults, we're just very good at hiding in the open. But whoever lives by the truth, verse 21, comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So, A couple of things here. 
uh, people of darkness, their deeds were evil, and our deeds were evil. And we just can't, we can't get past that because this, right, this natural slope and gravity of the world is toward condemnation. And even when we do good things, so often the good things that we do, like our motives are tainted. Our motives are somehow laced with sin, right? It's, it's not always, but quite often, you know, we, we love comfort rather than sacrifice. We want to fit in rather than stand up or out for Jesus. We want to do what feels good rather than what is good. This is a part of all of this stuff. And just we people, we, we don't like change. We don't like change and coming to the light or just to, to living in the light of Jesus. And by the way, Jesus later on in chapter 8, verse 12, will say, I am the light of the world. And so living in the light, living in the truth means following him, imitating him, being his people. But people don't like change. And so when there's something going on in our life, even if it's evil, if it's dark, if it's something that goes against the teachings of God, we're just so reluctant to change. I read about this sociological study where there's this whole group of people and they were told by doctors, you need to change a certain behavior in your life or you will die. They went back later to the group. 90% of them did not change a thing. 90%. So reluctant are we to change. Um, but part of this change, of course, comes out of, it flows out of this love that God has shown to us. Loved people love people. Right? Sometimes we say hurt people hurt people. Sometimes people act in a way that is familiar to what their experience has been in the past. Well, if this is really true for us, loved people love people. So it has a, a transformative impact on how we will live. Uh, Bible scholar N.T. Wright has a great word about this. He says, God's love comes to us where we are in Jesus Christ. All we have to do is accept it. But when we accept it, when we welcome the new choir director into our ragged and out of tune moral singing, we find a new desire to read the music better, to understand what it's all about, to sense the harmonies, to feel the shape of the melody, to get the breathing and voice production right, and bit by bit to sing in tune. I love that. He's like, since we've had this kind of love, it's like we want to welcome the, you know, the director, the music director into our lives who is Jesus, and he corrects our out-of-tune moral singing. So good. So we end our text there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's jump back to that verse 16, because that's really kind of where we're focusing today. And I've highlighted a few things. For God so loved the world. Okay, so let's unpack a few things in this ever important verse. So first of all, who said it? Now, it's interesting. This is just a point of interest. A lot of you have red letter um, Bibles, and they highlight the words of Jesus in red. So some of red letter Bibles will have this read because it's like Jesus is, is speaking. And this is a decision of the publisher. Some red-letter Bibles will have black words starting here, because in the original Greek language, uh, quotations don't uh, appear like they do in English. And so sometimes it's unclear when someone stops talking in the text and when uh, the author of the book here, uh, John, the disciple, is providing commentary. So it's just unclear who's saying this. It doesn't alter its authority. It's still in the Bible. It's still part of the inspired Word of God, so uh, it's, it's important, but it's just good to say that. Uh, secondly, notice that the first word is for. For God so loved the world. And as we've talked about before, whenever the word for is at the start of a sentence, it means that what we are reading is a logical outpouring of what previously occurred. And recall that in verse 14 and 15, it's talking about, you know, lifting up the snake on the pole in the wilderness from Numbers 21, and whoever looks at it will be healed. Jesus kind of uses that as an illustration for himself on the cross. So people who look to him, believe in him, will have eternal life. And so that's why we know that belief in him isn't just about who he is, but about what he has done for us on the cross. What's next? For God so loved the world. This is so important. Again, this shows us about the heart of God. It's a verb, agapao. It is specifically about outgoing sacrificial love. Outgoing sacrificial love. He so loved that kind of love, the world, that he gave his one and only son. What does it mean to give? Well, give, okay, that seems like a normal word. Give, give over. The implication is also give over sacrifice. And what we have just done in the sacrament of communion um, like demonstrates this physically in the sacrament that we do in giving over who? His one and only son. One and only son. Have you ever had a one and only child? Have you ever had a one and only beloved, a love of your life, a one and only best friend who, who you just needed and they were so precious to you? God didn't hand over the dregs. 
God didn't hand over something that did not matter to him. He handed over his one and only son for the benefit of us. There was nothing more valuable to himself that he could give us other than Jesus. One and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish. Now, perish. Before we get to the word believes, let's look at the word perish. And we need to focus on this a little bit. A couple of reasons. One, some people look at this This is a bit of a theological digression, but they look at this and they say, perish. Well, this means that if people uh, don't have a real, authentic, genuine trust in Jesus after they die, they're just snuffed out. They're just annihilated. They just perish. Um, That's not accurate. Um, And part of the reason for that is because when you look at all the passages together, you realize that this word for perish serves as kind of a a placeholder for larger spiritual death. And when you look at the larger passages, as difficult as this is to think about, we're talking eternal conscious torment. We're talking about the difficulties of hell. It's a very serious thing. I've got a picture of a, of a life boy here. And so think of a life boy. How valuable is that to us? Well, it kind of depends on our situation, what we're doing. And so let's say you're out in the middle of a field and it's a picnic, and the weather is nice, it's sunny like it is outside today, and you've got a picnic, and your friends are there, and someone comes up to you and says, how valuable, like, how, how valuable is this life boy to you right now? Well, there's not a lick of water in sight. I could take it or leave it. But what if your situation was changed? What if you were flailing around in the water, and, and you either couldn't swim, or you had been swimming so long and treading water that you were tired, and, and there's no one else around you, but all of a sudden this yacht comes up, and someone says, here's a life boy. How valuable is that to you? There's nothing more valuable in that moment. John 3.16 is the life boy. How many people are flailing about in the spiritual waters, and they think they're in the field reading recently from a, uh, a writer in the 14th century named Henry Suso, he describes the horror of what it is to be separated from the very presence of God in this, what we were just talking about. He writes, Ah, misery on misery, and it must last forever. Oh, forever and ever, what art thou? Oh, end without end. Oh, dying above all dying, to be dying, to be dying every hour and yet never to die. Oh, father and mother and all that we ever held dear, God bless you forever and ever, for we shall never see you and love you again, we, we must ever be separated from you. Oh, separation, oh, everlasting separation, how grievous thou art, oh, wringing of hands, oh, fretting, sobbing and weeping, oh, shrieking and howling forever, and yet never to be heard. Nothing but sorrow and distress must our wretched eyes behold, our ears being filled with nothing, but alas, nothing safe, only woe is me. Friends, tremors, tremors. So, what next? Whoever believes in him, that's the life boy. Why is that? To believe. Personal, genuine trust in Jesus and what he has done for us. Remember that God's heart is on a divine rescue mission of love for us, especially since he knows that we, his children, are in a world where the natural slope and slant is toward condemnation. That's from verse 18. And so he offers this to us, this wonderful, precious gift But because God is a perfect God, a holy God, a God of justice, there needs to be some sort of payment or atonement for our sin and brokenness. Or else he actually wouldn't be just. He wouldn't be fair. And so Jesus goes to the cross for us. We're the ones who should be up there, but he goes for us. This is called theologically the great exchange. The apostle Peter, who was there, the feet of Jesus, including the Sermon on the Mount and the rest of the time, says it's the righteous for the unrighteous. The righteous one is up there. We should be there. We're the unrighteous ones down here. But out of his great love for us, we reach out and receive his gift in faith, which is free, and he pays the price for what we deserve. And we get rescue, salvation, redemption, healing, forgiveness in this life and beyond. It's such a precious gift. Not only do we have exchanged lives in this life because of this love and because we, wanna, we want to be the foot, uh, feet and, and hands of Jesus in the world, but we also get to live with this incredible promise that this life is not all there is and there is these, this wonderful gift to come. It's called heaven. Speaking of descriptions, I was reading you know, the, the very famous um, uh, allegory by John Bunyan called The Pilgrim's Progress and right near the start of, of 
chapter 1, the main character, Christian, is talking to a character named Pliable, and he's describing Pliable, how great it is. Let's go the journey together. Let's go the narrow path, and there's going to be difficulties, absolutely, but it'll be so great to finally arrive at the celestial city. Then he describes what the celestial city is like, and I like his description because I pulls together so many of the different images. He says this. Sorry, next slide. There is an endless kingdom to be inhabited, an everlasting life to be given us, that we may inhabit that kingdom forever. There are crowns of glory to be given us, and garments that will make us shine like the sun in the firmament of heaven. There shall be no more crying nor sorrow, for he that is owner of the place will wipe all tears from our eyes. There we shall be with seraphims and cherubims, creatures that will dazzle your eyes to look on them. There also you shall meet with thousands and ten thousands that have gone before us to that place. None of them are hurtful, but loving and holy, every one walking in the sight of God and standing in his presence with acceptance forever. There we shall see the people that by the world were cut in pieces, burnt in flames, eaten of beasts, drowned in the seas, for the love they bear to the Lord of the place, all well, and clothed with immortality as with a garment The Lord, the governor of the country, hath recorded that in this book, the substance of which is, if we be truly willing to have it, he will bestow it upon us freely. Can I get an amen? Amen. Absolutely. What a credible, powerful, beautiful gift. And so in light of all this, I just want to offer us a few things to think about in light of this text as we think about how we apply this to our lives. Where do we need to go next with it? And here's the first, and it's very simple. Just memorize it. I know a lot of you have, and we would have done it this month, but we actually did this like a year ago, so it would be a repeat, but just memorize it, right? The more you get into God's Word, the more God's Word gets into you. That's right. And so there are times when we need that hope, we need that assurance, and if you know it, you can say it. Next. Take some time to think about the implications of this verse. It's so short, but there's so much in it, and so maybe it's just taking a walk, have a conversation with someone, lie on the couch and think about it. Think about the significance of what it means to spiritually perish. Think about what it means to, to, to go to the celestial city. Think about what it means to genuinely believe. Third, say this verse out loud when you sense spiritual darkness. Friends, there is real spiritual darkness and evil in our world. And so when you say it out loud, this is a part of the battle in which you engage. As a summary of God's good news and rescue... From the world with actual power, John 3.16 can and will shut the mouth of the evil one who would love nothing more than to intimidate God's people into a rabbit hole. You say it out loud, it is an actually invisible but real weapon in spiritual warfare. I was listening to Life 100.3 this past week, the Christian radio station. song by Ross King came on. It was so good. It's a prayer to God, the chorus. The things that I'm afraid of are afraid of you. How awesome is that? The things that I'm afraid of are afraid of you. Fourth, think about how you might talk about this with someone when the opportunity presents itself. Let's just think about, okay, this is an incredible hope, and maybe there's someone I know who needs to hear this. Or, And it's got to be real. It can't be fake. You can't have prefab answers. Just think about, okay, if an opportunity, if and when an opportunity presents itself, how might I respectfully just share something of this hope that you can't find anywhere else? Next, remember that loved people love people. For God so loved the world, love people, love people. Verse 21 talks about living by the light and by the truth. Remember what N.T. Wright said about welcoming the choir director into your life as he kind of shapes and, and, and tunes are out of sync, moral singing, whatever exactly he said. But it's so good, right? Because we've received this. It's not just something we believe in our head. It's something we live in our hearts. It's not just about a way of thinking, but a way of living. This is a part of our transformation. And sure, we have bad days and we mess up quite often, more often than we like to admit. But we are people committed to the path of love because that is what we have known. Lastly, just be honest with yourself about whether or not you have truly accepted this gift. Because friends, let me tell you, um, and I know that there's people watching right now at home, uh, maybe here or listening later on the podcast, who are just curious about this Jesus thing. They're wondering, think about it. Uh, and, and there's people who also have gone to church their whole life. I think it's about ticking this religious box that, that faith doesn't really matter, that this stuff doesn't have any eternal consequence. It does 
I urge you to respond favorably and with a loud and resounding to yes to this offer from God to you. I, I ask you to do this. Think about it. Pray about it. it. It's the ultimate prayer that I have for each and every one of you that we might accept this gift and live differently as a result. So we can think about some of those things. Last, final thought. A Martin Luther is one of the most influential figures of all time. Like he was, he lived in the 1500s and he started the, kind of the Reformation movement to bring back, you know, Reformation and purity to the church and uh, translated the Bible into the uh, German language of his people so that people could read for themselves the pure word of God. And he counseled so many people, princes and everyday people in his congregation, every, everyone else. And he uh, wrote hymns like, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which we are about to sing. But towards the end of his life, he was in incredible pain, and he had these horrible headaches, and someone offered him medication. And he said, my best prescription for head and heart is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. <laughs> there is a man who has taken the good news seriously in his head and his heart. Death is a part of life, not eternal life. Spiritually speaking, death is a part of life, not eternal life. So friends, since we do wake before we die, we love the Lord with open eyes. Amen.